Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce uh, Patrick Erlund, who uh, works at Ovaco Group, and he's going to talk to us about factors that influence fatigue of materials. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you very much for inviting. Uh, uh, considering that it's 50,000 people looking at you, uh, not directly, but in the future, I, I will beat Bruce Springsteen, who was in uh, Stockholm a month ago. It's only 30,000 there. Uh, I will talk about isotropy and fatigue, and it's a bit uh, different from what we heard before. We have heard very much about nanobainite, uh, and this also, I think, will tie in quite well, because this is another aspect that we also need to be considered. And I think very much, well, I will sort of tell you a bit in the end uh, uh, what we think about we could do in the future, also looking into more of these materials when it comes to fatigue. Uh, when I say fatigue, I mean high strength, high cycle fatigue. It's also something that you, I have not written any, any other authors, co-authors there, because it's so many, I don't want to ruin it, but it's all, in my, all the people in my group I will also to acknowledge to, to this work. So I will start to talk about fatigue a bit in general uh, when it comes to the influence of both the matrix and the defects. I think this is, this is really something that we have experienced. It's very important that we really think about those two different mechanisms. What are we really controlling the fatigue? Is it the, the matrix and is, is it, or is it def defects? Could we change the matrix in order to accommodate a feature better? Is one microstructure better than the other? I think there are, I know there are differences because we have seen that. And those kind of, of, of discussions, I think, is very important that we start to raise and start to put more effort and investigate things in. But also, of course, the defects, because they are there, and we need to consider them. Uh, we have been working quite much with very complex uh, loaded components. And what we realize that a lot of the fatigue data, uh, high strength steel that we see today that you find in the literature, is normally obtained from the most beneficial, from a steel producer point of view, direction. While a lot of components today are loaded in much more complex uh, or directions, which means this isotropy, uh, thinking about isotropic properties, becomes more and more uh, important. The other one is the influence of loaded volume. I will briefly go into that as well, because many want to have a fatigue limit for that material. I want it now. And I can say something, pick a number, because it depends on also the loaded volume. It's very important when it comes to defect controlled fatigue especially the high in the high strength speed. Last, we have also looked a bit in, in the influence of temperature. And all of these goes together a bit, because the influence of temperature is also very interesting. A lot of components today are not run in room temperature. Very few are, to be honest. And, and the influence of, of the temperature is becoming more important. And I think one reason is because we want to have use less material. We want to put more power in it. I think that's the general, when I've looked or heard the other pre presenters as well, a lot of it's going to higher strength because the requirements for higher strength, more ductile, more sustainable material uh, is out there. So I made this picture, uh, which I think is some of the, the essence. I mean, we have to consider the matrix and the defects, and we see that they will also work together. I had a look at it a couple of times, and I, I think perhaps it's not right. It gives the impression, but what we've seen also is that actually the matrix may influence how a defect are generating a fatigue crack. So it's a bit more complex, but I think it gives at least an impression we have to take those into account. When I talk about fatigue, I normally try to correlate it. We need to have a baseline. We need to know what we are comparing with. And I, I think one extremely good thing is that what Murakami made, he made all these theories about the, the size of an inclusion and uh, the, the hardness of material and related quite simply a, good, a lot of good um, rule of thumbs that you could use. And one rule of thumb is that the fatigue strength here looking at the very simple rotating bending fatigue is 
proportional to the hardness, which is the way of putting the strength. And of course, you see this correlation is quite good, but it starts to deviate. And what we would like to do is we want to develop and work with material up in this point, where it starts to have a deviation. Uh, so, of course, the reason is, as you all know, the matrix will control this part, whilst the defects will control this part. And this challenge is really, how do we move up above this line here, which is a typical thing that you would like to challenge this the nanomagnetic material and, and have more tests about them because what we've seen that it is possible to go over this sort of theoretical, which is an empirical, theoretical, simplified uh, model. It is possible. Uh, I think that's something will be very interesting for the future that we will work with. But also, if we want to go up in these high strength levels, we also need to consider the defects because they are there. And regardless then, if we do a material with a beautiful matrix, we finite form it for 17 months and get a very nice structure, it might fail from an inclusion instead, which would be very sad. There are a lot of different fatigue mechanisms. Um, sometimes you differentiate between contact fatigue and uh, structural fatigue, some call it. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, in principle, there are different test methods, but in the general mechanism, I think is fairly much uh, the same if you look in the, the material, uh, from the material uh, point of view. I think contact fatigue is a good way of, of really looking at the matrix material, what happens with the steel matrix, because you can see that quite, quite good, because it's a, it's a rather slow process that we, we see. We can run it for a long time. Uh, and what do you see when you make a rolling contact fatigue test? Now we see something underneath the rolling raceway. We develop what we call the dark etching region, which is well accepted. We know it's there. Uh, but what is it? I mean, this is really the starting point for a fatigue. And I think we have been very, very much relying on fracture mechanics when it comes to fatigue. And that means we are trying to calculate the fatigue without knowing the cause of the initiation. And I think what we should dig in more, more investigate more in, is to really in the initiation stage. So this process doesn't happen just for, for, for fun. It happens because you put in stress there, you have a certain temperature, and it develops. So it is something that happens, a process that happens in the material. We have done this test, which is actually then a test looking at a very much loaded zone. Compare that to a, the same sample, but away from that. So if you tested this rolling bearing material, it's a 100 chromium-6 material at a high load, fairly high temperature, very long time. And then you go take the scanning electron microscopy and you go and have a look where it's not loaded, but it's experienced. It's the same sample. Now you see the, the, you see the retained austenite, you see the residual carbides, and you see the, 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 the martensitic structure. If you move then into the dark etching region, what you see, you have a much coarser structure. Something has happened. This is, this is, not, this is not a continuum. This is, this is not a fracture mechanics process uh, that the crack has formed here. You see the residual car carbides, and you see much coarser microstructure, and you see the absence of the retained austenite. So the material is gradually changing. I, I, my professor, when I was uh, at the uh, Royal Institute of Technology, Hillert, he always said, you can always answer that it's more energetically uh, beneficial to go to that. I mean, that's, that was a standard phrase. But it's, it's quite good. The material wants to go to its lowest possible energy. And that's caused here by the stress and the temperature going. And I see this is, this is fatigue. This is the starting of the fatigue mechanism. 
And of course, then you are very interested in how does different structures respond to this. Of course, they also have defects. And these ones will enhance this because they are some strain racers putting much more strain, putting more energy into the material and promoting this material decay process. So this is the me mechanism of fatigue that I think is extremely interesting, trying to understand this. There are other ways of fatigue testing. You can make structural fatigue. I think it's the same mechanism. It looks differently because here you have another. So, but if you are, if you have a, have a good eye or if you have a microscope or sit in the microscope, you can see the same kind of phenomenon. You have some kind of, of, of work down of the material in the close in the vicinity of the defect, making it uh, fracture. So I see you decay the material until you need the fracture strength where you create a crack. And then you can start to play around with the fracture mechanics. So, so I usually, I mean, we made a lot of, lot of, lot of testing uh, when it comes to, to fatigue, and especially rotating bending fatigue, because it's a fairly simple way of, of producing samples. You can generate a lot of data in a short time. Um, and this is what we, what we come, come up with, or one thing that, that we come up, come up with. Uh, looking at, and it, it's just support the, the Murakami theory that the larger the defect, the more detrimental for fatigue. And it works quite well. And all these curves are established from actually experimental tests made on rotating bending fatigue. And then you see how you can increase the strength or the fatigue strength if you reduce the cri critical defect size. But of course, only up to, to some certain point where you have the, the intrinsic uh, fatigue limit uh, that puts the, puts the cap on. For high strength material that we are interested in, we are talking about, the potential is, is dramatic. So there are still a lot of things to do to go up there. For the oxides, we made a lot of tests. We have looked at all, assessed all the fracture surfaces, calculating from what was the smallest possible inclusion at the slowest possible stress that ever caused the fatigue failure. So it's thousands of samples that we created. For the carbides and the titanium, we should have a bit more care for they are more fitted, but that one is uh, the oxide I feel quite comfortable with. So I'll make a hop stop here. Just, <laughs> just so I would like to send a message because I think that that's, uh, uh, this is what I think is very important. Uh, we should put more effort into looking at, into the fatigue as a, a process happening in the material. Right now, I think we are using fracture mechanics too early. And we should move up there and we should help the fracture mechanic people because they are really good at calculating cracks when they have a crack. But we have to guide them here. And the physical metallurgist, uh, I think, has a good, good knowledge and base to drive these kind of investigations and understand this. Uh, and then, don't forget the defects, because at the end of the day, we also have to, to work with this one. OK. That was the general part. And then going into more uh, into the isotropic. What, what we see today is that more and more, as I said, products are, are higher stressed in very many different difficult uh, directions. This is an example for fuel injection part, where you have a hole drill there, you have a hole drill there, you have a chamber there, which is subjected to a pressure of around 2,000 bars, which means that in these kind of holes, in all directions, you will have a very high stress generated, which means if you have elongated defects in that region, going out from, from that, they will be potential causing a, a fatigue failure. Uh, that's why we are trying to get away from, from the conventional steel and developing more and more steels that are cleaner and with less uh, elongated and 
smaller inclusion sizes. Uh, these are typically sulfides deformed in the rolling directions, and the round one more representing the oxides. If we can make those to another shape, they will be more symmetrical. And that's possible. And then we need also, going from being physical metallurgists, to also talk to the, the process metallurgists. Because I think they also very need to be fed with this kind of information, what is really important for them. So today we have a possibility to choose by controlling the process a good way or different, different ways, going from different types of, of inclusion sizes uh, or shapes or morphology and compositions. It's sometimes represented that we can, we can choose how should we set the inclusions in order to be as harmless as ever possible. Uh, going from just low sulfur steel, just lowering the sulfur content might not be sufficient because then we know we will end up with quite big calcium aluminates. We need to do something else and then we can start to make isotropic steel that we call them, isotropic quality steel, which change their compositions into more deformable. And then understanding this, we also have to connect this to the degree of reduction because if we stand also look at that because that has another aspect. If you start to deform the material, the area fraction of the large size inclusions or the ones that will cause the fatigue will reduce because they will be smaller and not, not detrimental anymore. Whereas if you, if you have conventional, more conventional steels, they are less prone. So we have to work with that. And it's possible to, to do quite a, uh, significant improvements. For instance, if you look at the fatigue, uh, in this case, just rotating bending fatigue, we see that longitudinal-wise, the best, there is not a big difference between different steels, no cleanliness le levels. But if you go into the transfer and start to have this complex, then you can really benefit. So isotropy, should be considered when it's needed. We made a quite fun test, which was very simple, but quite illustrative, I think. Uh, we know that it is different depending on how big volume that you test, what fatigue data you give. And sometimes when people ask me, uh, what, what is the fatigue limit? As I said, I just pick a number. And you see the reasons. We took the same heat, we just machine from the same bar, different size samples in different dimensions. And then we tested different volumes. And this is the different result. So it's quite important to. You can refine this even more. I made one, one consideration when we look at both direction and volume. And this is quite interesting to, to look at. If you have a, the most beneficial direction, and you test the 100 cubic millimeter, yeah, you will run up and you can almost have a 15%, that's, uh, that's around 50%, which is the fatigue limit at 1300. And if you run that in a different direction, the 50% will be there, which is 350. That's a dramatic difference. And you also have a quite dramatic shift if you go and test a bigger volume. If you go up and test 1,000, yeah, the, for a 50%, it drops down to some where around 900. So pick a number. The last is the influence of temperature, which I think is new and what we think <coughs> is quite interesting. We have retrofitted uh, machines making fatigue testing at elevated temperatures. So I will more or less end with this one, which is really looking at what happens. And the interesting thing is not the absolute number here, because the absolute number here, in many cases, represents the steel cleanliness, but the slope that we see here. And I think different kind of material, different kind of microstructure will respond differently. And this is one way of, of looking at the material. How could you make a material more prone or more resistant to, to temperature. 
I think one interesting feature here, which is not outwritten, but I will tell you if you, if you can keep a secret. No, kidding. If you look at those two materials, they are from the same heat, same place, really, just heated, heat treated differently. And this shows that you do also influence, you have the same inclusion population, but you have a difference in fatigue limit, which means also the heat treatment and the microstructure will affect it. And I'll stop there. I got the one minute sign. I started to get nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, very interesting talk there, Patrick. Thank you very much. You. And I'll throw it open to questions. I've got one straight away in the middle. Work my way up. Oh, Lucy's got a question. Oh, um, I just wanted to know, uh, you said that the austenite um, in, in the contact fatigue uh, decayed due to stress and temperature. Is it that it's decaying into ferrite and uh, carbides, I presume, rather than tripping to micromsites? And that's what we, what we assume when we look into... Okay into the other, the other micro yeah. We didn't yeah. see anything you know, like a uh, virgin mortar site or nothing. Okay, yeah. so it's, it's literally just decomposing. But uh, I mean, it's a lo long time, so it had transfor transformed and then it continued to, okay. uh, to do something. And, and so how does the stress influence that transformation um, rather than it just being a, a temperature-driven um, decomposition of austenite? Uh, that's a really good question, and that's what I would like to know, or what we would like to know, because it is not purely the temperature, and they work together. That's what we see. I mean, if we... For instance, if you just temper it before and make the test, it's not the same as testing at the temperature, for instance, what we tested. So uh, one way or another, if, if it's dislocation movements, if it's uh, diffusion aided, there is probably some, some diffusion aided. Uh, we, don't, we are not fully aware of that. That's what we would like to look more into. So, so it could feasibly be um, that the, the stress state of the austenite is kind of a really... Um, uh, uh, toned down version of the kind of applied stresses that provoke it into a BCT transformations, maybe also um, making it slightly more favorable for it to transform into BCC alongside the temperature. Um, I don't know. No. Okay. <laughs> Could be whatever. It's, it's really <laughs> interesting anyway. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, have you attempted to compare the mechanical energy going in during a contact fatigue test with the thermodynamic energy required for those changes in the microstructure? Yeah, shit, I struggled with that, yeah. Um, not on the rolling contact with you. I, I, I made a, quite a lot of, of, of work looking into the number of cycles, the temperature, the stress, uh, and trying to see what is actually the energy that we have put in here. And then trying to correlate that to uh, um, And I think that's something that we will continue to do because I, I like that idea, looking at the more energy. Uh, at that point, I didn't get any clear when I make, made it quick and dirty. I didn't make a, a very good correlation. I think you have to, but I think we should dig more into it. Okay. Um, um, well, I was, well, concerning that question, we actually published a paper on computational material science early this year on that very topic. But my question is, um, is there, um, have you considered what are the effects of hydrogen ingress during processing in fatigue life, during processing? Because this, um. is, this is a hot topic in other steel families, mm. and I wonder if, if you have studied that. No, we haven't really studied. I mean, that's a very hot topic, in, and, and of course, you see that if you charge it with hydrogen, you, you've seen certain effect. What we have done, we are testing on, on material with fairly low hydrogen content. We are below 0.5 ppm normal. Uh, and we haven't made any fancy heat treatment, so we have, we have not really looked in, into that at all. Thank you. Okay, Will, yep. Um, one question. Why did you choose the, the temperature you used for the rolling contact fatigue test, 100 degrees? And have you performed any rolling contact fatigue testing at other temperatures, including room temperature? and see what is the difference in the... Uh, yeah, we, we, done. We, have, we have a fairly simple rolling contact fatigue washer, flat washer test machine, and we have looked at the temperature, and you can clearly see the influence of temperature on the material decay uh, on the rolling contact fatigue. And the other question was? 
Why did you choose that temperature? 100. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we start to see more effects within reasonable time, I would say. And it's not a very high temperature which makes it crazy either. I have a question. So if I have uh, well under, under understood, uh, you would like to improve uh, the isotropy of the material by re reducing the number of elongated in inclusion in the, in the steel, so by lowering yeah. the sulfur content. Yeah. But what about, uh, uh, first of all, okay, in, uh, in any case, the oxide co content uh, will uh, r remain a source uh, for uh, uh, failures during uh, fatigue testing. Mm. And in any case, what about the machinability of the pieces then? Because yeah. sulfur is uh, yeah. often considered as uh, yeah. improving the, the machinability. You're absolutely right. And, and what we're doing to reduce the sulfur content, we do, and also the oxide content. And then, uh, then you will end up with a much poorer machinability. So, but fortunately, we have very good companies working with machining tools. I mean, and and they are working quite much because today you can find these low sulfur steels, and you can you can machine it, and but it, it you, you you need to develop. But yeah, uh, you sir. Yeah, um, I have a question with, uh, so you attribute, if I have well understood you, the anisotropy of the fatigue properties to the elongated shape of the inclusions. So it's, is this right it's in your yeah. analysis? Yes. But what about, is there, is there any effect of crystallographic anisotropy? You know that the metal matrix also has a, also maybe anisotropy. Not, not what we've seen. I mean, not, not of any significant, no. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my question is about your slide on the relationship between fatigue uh, life and the size of the sample. Yeah. You know, if you can comment something on that, and also whether you have checked what is the particle that, that has actually caused the fatigue in relationship with your relationship between oxides, sulfides, carbides. Uh, which slide did you mean? Um, size of the sample. Size of the samples? Yes. Oh. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> uh, that one. If we have a, uh, yeah, well, I mean, we, we have looked at uh, all, all the samples that we test, we look and we ensure that there is an inclusion in it causing the fatigue. If it's, uh, if it's not an inclusion causing the fatigue, then if it's a surface scratch, we have to make a retest because then it, we call it a, a failure. Uh, so, so is this related Sorry. to the probability of finding yeah. a critical inclusion when you yeah. increase the size? Purely. <coughs> okay. Thank okay, you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we'll throw it over to people asking questions from uh, around yes. the world now. Um, we got a question from Tenerife, Argentina. Uh, in the second slide, there seems to be no data point from the metrics in the transverse direction. Are there any of this available, how would they compare with overall picture? Uh, there was no uh, data point from the metric in the transverse direction. Uh, I think we mean the, the okay. Mean the uh, uh, no, uh, there is no because we haven't tested. Uh, we have concentrated on that s strength level, so okay. we haven't so far made any uh, transversal test in uh, the hardness less than, than 750, I think. So that's still something that we would like to, to move on. But w I mean, we've developed a quite good method of testing transfer by splitting up a tube. We make a tube out of it, we split it, and gently uh, for forge into a flat, and then we take samples. So we have very good control, so. Th thank you. Another question is, have you observed any failure from a dark etching region? If you did, uh, how does it happen? Does crack, does the crack form from this? No, uh, not, not that I can say from a dark etching region by itself, no, uh, okay. no. There's a lot of peculiarities, but no, I can say that. Okay, thank you. Go on then, Harry. <laughs> so, so I'm very surprised. Nobody has asked a question. How did you produce isotropic Inclusions. Oh, that's, a good, that's a good question. 
Good, good question. Uh, no, it's it's a matter of do, uh, working with the process of metallurgy. Uh, it's not uh, it's not something that we talk about. I don't, I see a lot of other steel producers are do, doing the same. It's not that we are extremely unique. We are doing it a good way, but uh, we cannot tell you. I cannot tell you. <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's the simple <laughs> simple answer. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs>